listening to Overwatch League Daily, your daily source for Overwatch League news, scores, and more. Here's your host, Kicked Tripod. Good morning, Overwatch League fans. This is your Overwatch League Daily episode for January 13th, 2018. Today, I'm joined by Overwatch coach and analyst Reprise to break down yesterday's matches. The first match of the day put the Dallas Fuel against the Los Angeles Valiant, two juggernauts vying for the perceived top spot in the West. The Dallas Fuel put up a respectable performance against league favorite Seoul Dynasty on Wednesday, while the Valiant took a commanding 4-0 victory over the San Francisco Shock. This match did not disappoint as the first two maps were some of the most back-and-forth games we've seen in recent competitive Overwatch. It all started on Junkertown. Both teams left their defense at home for this map as both teams go the distance. In the end, the Valiant take a surprising 8-7 victory. Next, we went to Horizon Lunar Colony. Neither team disappointed here as we again went six rounds deep, but this one actually ended in a rare draw. It was all downhill for the fuel from there as soon and Silk Thread would continue to outperform the fuel DPS at every turn. The emotional Dallas fuel would not take another point on Ilios or Nimbani and they would lose the series to the Valiant 3-0. So Reprise, something that we've noticed is that the Immortal squad, which is now the Valiant, really struggled against the Envious squad, which is now the core of the Dallas Fuel. This looked like an entirely new team. What changed? Honestly, soon happened. Immortals never had a tracer that consistently pops off the way the soon does. And ever since dive comp became meta, Immortals struggled. Now there's tons and tons of factors that also go into this, such as new coaching staff, uh, in-game leading responsibilities possibly being shifted around, picking up unco on support, that's a huge one, uh, and not to mention getting adjusted to the language barrier between the three Koreans they picked up in the summer. Uh, language barriers are no joke, especially in a communication-heavy game like Overwatch. It's one thing to pick up a tracer who doesn't speak your language because you can just, you know, let him go nuts in the back line, do tracer things. But uh, transitioning to Korean tanks and a main support player, that could not have been easy. But time has shown that it was clearly worth it. Korean superstars aside, though, I really do think Soon is the major factor in the rise to being one of the best teams in Overwatch. He's consistently getting picks on supports and generally any hero under 200 HP. And let's not forget his Widowmaker is absolutely insane as well. I think that there are a lot of people who are hesitant to say that the Valiant would beat the Fuel, especially after the preseason where the Valiant, they won both their matches, but they were by no means decisive. Where specifically did we see the Valiant start to take on the Fuel and really turn the tide in these matches? I don't really think this is so much on Valiant's side as much as it was Dallas just not playing like themselves. Dallas had extremely questionable strategy choices throughout the entire series. Now, I know that Dallas possibly has like the widest hero pool of any team in the OWL, but running quad tank on Junkertown with Siegel on Winston, uh, Mickey, Diva, Effect, Zarya, Taimu, Roadhog, no shield. They had no mercy. Harry Hook was on Lucio. Kusta was on Moira. I just, I, I don't understand it at all. I don't get it. Sure, they caught LA off guard with their forward hold right outside the spawn door on the defense by just running at them with like 3,000 HP worth of heroes. But where's the damage? Where's the burst potential in that team comp to take care of the Bastion? Once the Valiant realized what Dallas was doing, they just played a little more careful, went out of spawn slower, got the Bastion on the car, and just mowed down everything in sight. Until Dallas was forced to switch to running what they should have been running that entire time, which was just standard dive with the Genji Tracer. Then you have Lunar Colony, where Dallas does the same thing. They do a quad tank strat with no mercy, which is totally fine for the first point attack, where Soon is running the Widow, and there's just not enough Widow damage to deal with their four tanks, and they get on point and just own everybody. But Valiant just wises up to that and plays second point way better, but Soon on the Tracer and just clean house, forcing Dallas to switch off and burning a lot of time off the clock. Then they realize it's not going to work out. They go standard Tracer Soldier dive and cap the point. I'm not sure if these quad tank comps are just owning everyone in scrims or what's going on, but I was completely shocked by that. Like I know they're known for weird wacky comps and it working out and sometimes not working out, but this was a little too weird for me. 
And then after those two maps, when Dallas just doesn't have a point on the board, I think they were just mentally done at that point. They were not playing like themselves at all. Dives weren't coordinated. Players were going for so many solo plays. Ults were being wasted. And it was just it was just sloppy all around. One thing I will say with credit to Valiant, besides the obvious soon is insane and he's the reason this team's so good, uh, is uh, Silk Thread is a beast. Like, he is so good on every single hero he played tonight, and I'm assuming we're going to see a lot more of him in the future. But the bottom line is that Dallas was just running a lot of weird stuff and making interesting choices, even for Dallas, who's known for very interesting choices and compositions. That combined with the fact that Valiant played very, very well, I think just sealed the deal. Like, once once Lunar Colony was done, I, the series was over, in my opinion. How do you feel like each core's acquisitions played? So XQC, Siegel, and Custa for the Fuel, and soon Unko and Silk Thread for the Valiant. Um, I think Siegel started out great on Junkertown by just obliterating everybody with Hanzo with that pit comp they were running with the the Roadhog, the Bastion, the Hanzo, the Widow. Like Siegel was popping off as well as Effect. Uh, but later in the series he. He just didn't really seem like his old self on the Genji on Ilios. I don't know if it's because he just doesn't play Genji as much these days or what, but he was a little off tonight on Ilios for sure. But I'm I'm very confident he'll bounce back. He's been consistently a top tier player for since closed beta. As for Kusta, Kusta was an interesting pickup I didn't expect, but I totally agree with. And I think he's a really good pickup. Uh, not only is he a solid support player, mechanically speaking, but I think he adds a level of consistency to the communication of Dallas. Uh, from what I've heard from players and, and other staff, I've heard you can pretty much always count on him to be in, like, in an upbeat mood, helping out with strats a lot. That kind of stuff although if the quad tank defense on junker town was his idea i might have second thoughts about that one uh but for real i, th I think kusta is a great pickup for dallas he's super solid as for xqc i think he's he's easily one of the top three winston players in north america for sure uh, and he adds a lot to this team not only in terms of his winston play for the dive comps which is essentially run 95 percent of the time these days but even his orissa and ryan are both really really good and it gets it gets overlooked a lot but he's a very solid uh reinhardt player and orissa player too i feel like siegel and mickey not being exactly at their best on genji and diva respectively really hurt xqc's winston I mean, there's only so much you can do as a Winston player without your D.Va and Genji pulling their weight. And overall, I think XQC played fine tonight. I covered Soon previously, and there's not much more to be said about him. I mean, he's just insane. Easily one of the best tracers in the world. And he's been that way for a long, long time. I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, he's definitely a crucial pickup for the Valiant, who's historically had issues with the dive meta. And then as for Unko, uh, unfortunately, the Observers didn't spend too much time on him, so it was hard to tell. But I did see some very clutch trances, and I saw him getting consistent picks in the kill feed throughout the entire night. Uh, he's easily one of the best Zen players in the world. His positioning and mechanics on Zen are just really, really top tier. Like You could make an argument that he is the best Zen in the world. I wouldn't make that argument, but, <laughs> but somebody could. For the second match of the night, we saw the Florida Mayhem go up against the Boston Uprising. While neither team won their first match earlier in the week, both had strong enough performances to turn some heads. The Mayhem took a map off the London Spitfire, and Boston took a map against NYXL on Thursday. Between a stronger performance from Logix and Swish looking more comfortable on his tank heroes, the community was fairly split about this match overall. However, the Mayhem's woes continued as Logic underperformed and Tavik was unable to pull through and clutch situations. The uprising would hold the mayhem to two points on Dorado before going to Anubis. There we saw a lot of the same as Striker and Dream Casper were just unrelenting. Things only got worse from there as the Boston Uprising take two decisive rounds on Oasis. With the victory assured for Boston at that point, we were hoping to see a spark from the mayhem on Eichenwald. Instead, we saw a lifeless offense from Florida and Boston held them to just one point. Instead, we saw a lifeless offense from Florida and Boston held them to just one point. In the end, this one was a decisive decisive victory for the uprising taking the series four to zero the saying that we keep seeing over and over again is that the mayhem seem to live and die by the performance that we see from logics do you have any insights on why we might be seeing this inconsistency from him um i think most teams seem to live and die by their tracer to some extent 
Uh, teams are just better at dealing with Genjis in general these days, especially against Dragon Blades in particular, which makes even the great Genji players inconsistent just due to the nature of the hero and how vulnerable he is when he's using his ult. Like, a lot of times a Zen has to trance just to support a Dragon Blade so that so he doesn't instantly die in, in two seconds, or point two seconds to a, a Winston Diva just burst combo. Like a Tracer, for example, can, can miss three Pulse Bombs in a row in a match and still carry the entire team by just one clipping Mercies and Zens left and right. Whereas a Genji player relies very heavily on getting that fight winning Dragon Blade where he kills three people and wipes the whole team and everyone's super excited and it's on Reddit the next day. Also, Tavik is basically either playing Genji or Widow most of the time, which are both heroes that are prone to inconsistency due to how their abilities work. And my personal opinion is that Tavik just he takes too long sometimes to swap off the Widow when it's not working, which just puts that much more pressure on Logix to be at his absolute best for Florida to get anything done. So far, it really seems that Huck is delivering on his promise of a well-organized group of scrappy, teachable, and fundamentally sound players. What really stood out to you about their performance last night? Honestly, I was one of the naysayers when the Boston lineup got announced. I think almost everyone had them at least near the bottom or at the bottom of their power rankings. Uh, but boy, were we all wrong. Uh, they 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 must have an amazing coaching staff because this team on paper should not be working as well as it is. And it certainly should be, shouldn't be 4 owing Florida. But here we are. Uh, I hate to constantly harp on DPS players, but I really think Striker just being as rock solid as he is on Tracer is a huge factor. But the other big factor that caught me totally by surprise was just how good Dream Casper was at so many different heroes. His Genji's solid, his McCree is amazing, and now we see his Roadhog is insane. I think he had like an 88% hook accuracy or something last night. That's ridiculous. So all of that combined with the fact that they're running all these different comps, doing triple tank and full dive and dive with the McCree. I, I, I just think everyone's surprised with how versatile this, this cast of, of players is for Boston. And it's really cool to see. When we saw Florida play well against London, there were many who were optimistic, including myself, honestly, that they were returning to the prior form finally, that they got their practice in. Swoosh would start to perform up to how we know he can perform. Logics with that consistency. But with an 0-4 performance against Boston, do you think that Florida is deserving of their 0-2 record? 0-4 if you include the preseason? Where do their problems lie? I mean, at the end of the day, they are deserving of their their O2 record, but they did play a lot better against London. That being said, they have some weird, I don't know if it's mood problems or tilting or, or, or what it is, but they just seem to get in this zone where they're just not really playing together. Like they're all just kind of playing passive and you have logics in the back, just like trying his hardest to just kill every single hero that has... 200 HP. Um, I, I don't know, honestly. It, it's weird. It could be a problem as simple as uh, uh, coaching staff or players not wanting to listen or change their play styles, or it could be uh, Zen positioning. Zupe was getting picked off like all the time really early. It could be that. It could it could be a whole number of factors. But the one thing I could point out from what I personally saw was Tavik did not have a typical Tavik Genji or Farah performance. Dream Casper was just showing him up all the time on Gigi and Farah. It, it was bizarre, actually. I, I was not expecting that. Let's go to the final match for the evening where we saw the Shock, who struggled to find their preseason mojo in their first match against the Valiant, take on Shanghai, who have yet to win a match in the Overwatch League and have only won two maps throughout the preseason and regular season combined. In the preseason, the Dragon had shown faint glimmers of hope thanks to Dia's strong performance on hitscan heroes, but ultimately a lack of a strong tank performance from MG and Roshan left Shanghai looking stale. In the regular season debut, it seemed that Roshan and MG had finally addressed some of those glaring preseason problems, but between Undead and Dia inexplicably trading roles and an uninspiring performance from Five King and Altering, it's pretty clear that the Dragons have a long way to go against top-tier teams. The Shock would be an excellent test for Shanghai's true skill. To put it simply, neither team looked their best, but the Shock would come away with this one three maps to one. Shanghai did full hold San Francisco on Horizon Lunar 
Lavender Colony, but besides that anomaly, the shot consistently bested the dragons on the shoulders of Dante and Baby Bay. Reprise of Got Something That's Bothering Me. We saw Dia play Widowmaker and Undead play the Tracer in the preseason. Since the regular season began, they've seemed to switch roles. Do you think this is the better call for the team in the long term? Well, I mean, they they both seem to be performing better on their, their new roles, so I guess I can't argue against it. Although I think it's more about Undead being the better Widow more than more so than Dia being the better Tracer. Although I don't think Undead was up to par with Baby Bay, he was winning the Widow duel some of the time, uh, a decent amount of the time, which is definitely a step in the right direction. I think the bigger issue on Shanghai is it, it seems like their tanks, I mean, I can't know what they're thinking, but it seems based on what I'm seeing and how they play that their tanks are just too eager to, quote, make space, you know, which is what, what tanks are supposed to do, but... They're kind of just going in and hoping for the best, and then the DPS players can't deliver in that short time frame before they're dead. Uh, so I think their tank players just need to work on their positioning and, and not not feeling too obligated to, to quote, make space, as everyone likes to say. Like, you see it with D.Va players more so than Winston players, in my opinion. Like, uh, even Nevix, it happens to him all the time, where I'll just see him hit shift and just boost into six people and immediately get demacked, and I'm just sitting here thinking, like, I, what could possibly be the reasoning for doing that? I just, it doesn't make sense. I don't. Someone's telling him to do that, or someone's calling a dive, or I think, uh, I think Shock and uh, and Shanghai actually have really similar issues. I just think Shanghai's are, are worse in the tank department, and I think Shock's DPS players uh, make up for a lot of that in, in huge ways with their crazy plays. So we've kind of seen Baby Bay step up into the spotlight as kind of like an anchor DPS role, at least with the positions that he's been playing. Do you feel like he's living up to that anchor DPS reputation that we're seeing with other teams? I don't know if I would call him an anchor DPS right now in the sense of his consistency, because he does have games where he's just kind of average. But I've heard his comms before and scrims and stuff like that. And this guy has so much passion and is constantly talking about how he wants to use his ults, what comps the team should run, what their win conditions are, just way above and beyond what most DPS players actually say in-game, to be honest. I think he is an anchor player, and that he's almost an in-game leader as well as a really solid DPS player who has tons of potential and a super high skill ceiling and can totally take over games, and does so fairly often. <laughs> My thanks to Reprise for joining me on the show today. Make sure to follow him on Twitter at ReprisOW. Tomorrow I'm going to be joined by Overwatch caster and analyst Matt Pixie Carroll. Going on later today, we've got some really great matches. Starting at 11 a.m. Pacific time, we've got London Spitfire taking on the Philadelphia Fusion. Then we've got the New York Excelsior taking on the Houston Outlaws. And finally, we've got the Soul Dynasty taking on the Los Angeles Gladiators. Remember, you can find the show on all of your favorite podcast outlets, including iTunes, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, Google Podcast. We're also on Spotify now as well. So make sure to go ahead and follow us there. We're also on YouTube. Click on the link in the show notes to find us. You can also listen to the show on the front page of winstonslab.com. If you want to stay in touch, you can email me at overwatchleaguedaily at gmail.com, tweet me at OWLDailyShow, or join our Discord at discord.me slash OWLDailyShow. You can also find links to everything at overwatchleaguedaily.com. That's going to do it for today. We'll see you tomorrow with another episode of Overwatch League Daily.